Welcome back to the Plus Ultra Podcast. This is Tracy R. Twyman. Now comes part two of our interview with Peter Lavenda, author of Unholy Alliance, A History of Nazi Involvement with the Occult, and the brand new three-part series, Sinister Forces, A Grimoire of American Political Witchcraft. Later on, we're going to get into the subject of the Necronomicon, which Lavenda had some involvement with, and has even been rumored to be the author of. But first, a little necessary background information on the man, Lavinda. He's led an exciting life that started with him founding his own Orthodox Church, attending the funeral of Robert Kennedy as a clergyman, and working as an unofficial intelligence asset for the U.S. military. Here once again is Peter Lavinda. Peter, where did you grow up and what sort of a upbringing did you have? Uh, well, I grew up all around the country. I was born in New York City, but uh, my parents moved around a lot as I was growing up. So we lived in... Uh, Indiana and Chicago for a number of years, and New Hampshire for a couple of years. And but I basically uh, graduated from high school in New York City. We eventually made our way back there. My father was a, a kind of a failed actor, and uh, between one thing and another, our family just wound up wandering around uh, the country uh, looking for work. And I understand that your father, uh, at one point, was involved in something that has caused you a bit of embarrassment and got you some scrutiny from the government, too. Yeah, it, 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 his name is mentioned uh, in a few books, um, mostly books written by academics about a particular period in the history of Gary, Indiana, which is where he was born and, and raised. And uh, he was involved in something called the Gary School Strike, which I believe was 19. 45 or 1946, something like that. And that was a school strike that was started over uh, integration. There was a move to integrate the uh, public schools in Gary, Indiana. And my father was involved in some kind of debating team at Broble High School, which is where he was uh, going to school. He was the president of the students' union at the same time. And the debate was over whether or not the school should be integrated or segregated. And my father came down on the segregation part and uh, became kind of well known as a segregationist and as the leader of the Gary School Strike. So basically, he was a segregationist, and uh, it caused so much uh, furor in the country at the time that Frank Sinatra, who was on his way, I guess, to some gig in Chicago, decided he would stop over in Gary, Indiana, and try to uh, solve the problem to the force of his own personality, I suppose. So he, uh, he made a visit to the Gary High School uh, auditorium where there was a big meeting on the issue of integrating the schools. And uh, he was not warmly received. Uh, he was seen basically as an outsider trying to come in and solve the uh, problems. And uh, not finding very much success there, he went to my father's home uh, to try to convince him to uh, call off the school strike. So you'll find in, um, there's a book out, I believe, that's called The Frank Sinatra File which is a uh, collection of the FBI files on Sinatra, particularly during this period, and my father's name is mentioned there a number of times. The FBI thought my father was a communist, which is the funniest thing, because they knew that Sinatra had had some kind of uh, associations with some leftist or socialist uh, types, and they thought that Sinatra's presence in Indiana was some kind of a socialist uh, thing, and therefore they were making the assumption that my father was somehow a communist, which was 180 degrees opposite from what he was. I mean, as a segregationist, he was a right-wing kind of John Bircher type, mm -hmm. and uh, there was no way in, in, on earth that you could mistake him for a communist. But at any rate, the FBI thought he might be, so they were they were collecting files on him. How, how did your father react to having Frank Sinatra come over to his house? He threw him out. <laughs> what was his name? Leonard. Leonard Lavenda. Now, I understand um, around the time you were uh, going to graduate high school, you were staring the possibility of the draft in the face yeah. and trying to figure out how to get out of that and you couldn't afford to go to college to use that as a way out. So you and a friend of yours named Andrew came up with a very unusual idea. Can you explain that to us? <laughs> sure. Well, like many things in life, there's always more than one motivation. Um, my friend and I were very involved in religious studies, let's say. I was very involved in studying religion. It had always been a fascination of mine uh, since I was very young. And all forms of religion, uh, including you know extreme forms like occultism or mysticism on the one hand, and different religious groups on the other, I would uh, haunt all sorts of, of uh, churches and temples, whatever I could find, just to get some kind of an idea of what was going on. 
And I was very religiously minded uh, as a late, in my late teens. I was really thinking uh, seriously of some kind of religious vocation. And I had met a friend of mine in high school in the Bronx who was uh, had a similar background to mine. He was half Czech and half Slovak. And he also had a fascination for the church, but his fascination was more for the um, the pomp and ceremony of it. Mm. He liked the uh, he liked the vestments and he liked the uh, the golden uh, chalices and all the rest of it. And uh, he liked the way in which you know clergymen were afforded all sorts of extra privileges that uh, the rest of us didn't enjoy. And this was a different time. I have to remind you and your listeners. Back in the 1960s, uh, clergymen had a lot of status. I mean, you, they wouldn't get charged going on a bus or a subway. People would just, uh, you know, allow them on for free. You know, this is the kind of respect that they gave. A clergyman could walk into uh, almost any building anywhere and be accorded all sorts of immediate uh, respect. Um, these days, of course, have changed a lot, but in the old days, this was an old-fashioned kind of idea, and my friend really liked that. So, <laughs> two of us were graduating high school in 1968, which pretty much meant we were probably going to Vietnam or something close to it. And uh, my idea was, why not form a church? Because we knew that clergymen would not be drafted. So we formed a church. We uh, organized a church around a man that we knew who was a uh, bishop from Slovakia who was living as a displaced person in the United States. And he had been had a very checkered career uh, in the church. He was involved with... Um, a church in Czechoslovakia, there was the invasion by the Nazis and the invasion by the Russians, and eventually he got out and came to the United States, and the church was sort of formed around him. So we got together and said, you know, let's form a church, let's use this guy as our spiritual leader, and we'll incorporate the church, and, and you, we'll become clergymen in the church. You, of course, were 17 years old at the time? That's right. Okay. Yep. Please continue. Just wanted to point well, that out. Yeah, well, we were a little precocious, it's true. But, you know, it was 1968, it was Vietnam. I mean, it was. We were motivated. So the motivation was definitely there. And so we said, you know, let's, let's do this. And we incorporated it. Of course, we were too young, actually, to sign the incorporation papers ourselves. So we had to get other people to help us do that. And uh, so we had adults sign off on the papers, and we, we incorporated the church. And we held services. I mean, we, we held services every Sunday. Um, we went and visited other churches. Uh, in New York City. This was an Orthodox church. Who, who uh, came to the, the services? Excuse me? How, did people come to the services? Oh, sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Friends of ours, perhaps. Um, it got to the point where we had developed a kind of a, of a small floating congregation, you know. Um, we were in, in, intent on doing this the right way, you know. So we, we were trying to run a legitimate ecclesiastical type organization I and mean, that was that was the whole point um, so what we did is we uh, imposed upon a uh, Protestant minister in the Bronx who had a church a very nice uh, Dutch reformed church and we managed to cut a deal with him that we would be able to use his church for services you know on days when he wasn't using it so he would have a, a, a service on Sunday let's say at uh, eight or nine o'clock in the morning and then we would do something at 11 o'clock or, or whatever so uh, it worked out pretty well for a while. 